All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first and foremost, there's fresh coffee. So um, we're here for the uh, the first uh, research seminar for Dr. Carla Moreno Torres. As you know, uh, we're looking for filling a, uh, a new faculty position at the Uvalde Research Center that has a, a wildlife disease focus. And so, so Dr. Torres is a, a vet epidemiologist and fellow with the Oak Ridge Institute of Science and Education who collaborates with the USDA Center for Epidemiology and Animal Health uh, within the Monitoring and Modeling Unit and Ag Research Center, ARS, Plum Island Animal Disease Center. So she's from Fort Collins, Colorado. Her research involves uh, computational modeling of infectious diseases in livestock and wildlife population. Her current projects include uh, foot and mouth disease and modeling uh, the infection dynamics of, of that particular virus. She received the DVM and master's degree from the National Autonomous University of Mexico in 2005 and 9, respectively. And after that, she studied uh, at Ohio State University and received a, a PhD there. So with that, uh, her title of her seminar is Infection Dynamics of Multi-Host Pathogens and Complex Adaptive Systems. All right. Thank so, you very much for the introduction. And I'll sit down. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, my first week as a graduate student, I was asked, Carla, what do you want to do? And at that moment, I thought, well, I'm a veterinarian with interest in wildlife that understand disease processes, and I became here to do, to be an infectious disease modeler. But the question was, what do you want to do? So I knock on doors from diverse faculty from diverse disciplines at Ohio State University, from anthropology to epidemiology to ecology to mathematics. Through that initial networking, it's how, how I develop uh, my graduate work. Nowadays, I identify myself as a holistic wildlife epidemiologist by training. Uh, in general, for example, I use various discipline approaches to understand complex adaptive systems. And today, I'm going to talk about infection dynamics of multi-host pathogens in complex adaptive systems. This is actually the general view of my, in my interest in my research, and my mission for the New Wildlife Disease Ecology Program will be to enhance sustainable livelihoods through actively understanding complex adaptive systems um, at, at this uh, center in, in Uvalde. All right. So these images that you see here uh, are actually the different players that you will see through my speech when I talk about this multi-host pathogen system. I'm going to do my talk. It's uh, mainly based in four big topics, so setting the stage, so I will talk about this, the ecosystem. The second one is my research experience. I'm going to show you what I did during my graduate work through three projects. Then it's going to be about my current research work, so what I'm doing to expand my knowledge in this area. And finally, the mission, vision, and plan for the Wildlife Disease Ecology Program. So with that, I'm going to start with, through my initial networking, with the wildlife um, species. So I talked with a wonderful wildlife veterinarian, and she expressed to me her, her concern of a health of a pair baby deer that is captive at the wilds. So the wilds is the largest conservation center in North America, and it's situated in southeastern Ohio. So pear baby deer is actually endemic to China. And this species, although it has been recovered from extinction, is still uh, uh, extinct in the nature. And one year before I came to Ohio State, there was an abortion storm of this species at the wilds. And an abortion storm was that more than 50% of these per deer females had aborted. So being the mission of the wilds, the conservation of endangered species and reproducing this species, this become a very important health issue. 
this, so this is in Ohio, and this is the environment at the wilds. So what you are looking here is actually the central pastures of the wilds. That is where Per David Deer lives, and actually mimics really well where Per David Deer will live in China. There is another part that is very important about the wilds, and that's actually their configuration of this. And as you see, there are these roads, and it's a, a kind of a safari zoo type, so people can go and see these different species, so it's a way to have this uh, alive. Uh, but the configuration is very important. So the most endangered species will be at the center of the pastures, and this is the center of the pasture, and the least endangered species will be at the periphery. And in general, the thought is that if a disease were to occur through this ecosystem, then you have the least endangered species surrounding the most endangered species, so you have time to figure out what do I do with, more, with my more um, endangered species. And so the, the per baby deer shares the pasture with different ones. So this is the talking, and the talking actually is sharing the pasture with the per baby deer. But there are other different species, so there is mainly ruminants in this uh, conservation center. Those are white rhinos, and this is bison. So bison actually well, is endemic to North America, and bison is the one that is at the periphery. So again, so it's endemic species, so you would expect that if a disease comes through this endemic species, you will see what's going on, and then you have some kind of control strategy to implement. Surrounding the wilds, there is rural area. And the mainly livelihood for these farmers is actually beef cattle. So there is dairy and there is beef, but there is mainly dairy cattle. And in the picture here, this is a road. So crossing that road, you will see the bison herd. So actually, these herds are really close together. The only, one that, the only thing that separates is like a road. And then, um, so from the farmer's point of view, there is these fences that are not that tall. And the idea is just to, they just want to keep their livestock inside of those pastures. But from the wilds, there are these fences that are much more taller. And the idea is exactly the same, to keep the wild animals inside of the wilds. And in this ecosystem, there is also other type of wildlife. So there is free-ranging wildlife, such as the white-tailed deer. So white-tailed deer, we room across these different landscapes. They do not get into inside of the main pasture, but they do get in the peripheries, and, and you will see later how, a little bit more of the layout. Also, within the wilds, there are other type of free-ranging species. So we have, these are uh, um, coyotes, scats, and this picture was taken from inside of the wilds. And these are, it's a manure, manure from a cow, and on top of it, there is actually the scat of a coyote. So at that moment, when you see, and that picture actually is taken from the farm's side. At this time, you see, okay, there are interactions happening here, and then therefore, a wildlife livestock inter interface is plausible in this ecosystem. Therefore, you will start thinking a lot of multi-host pathogens that are in this are possible too. There is another very important aspect about the success of the project that I work on, and that was the community involvement. So I use uh, their fairs. Uh, so I went to the Muskingum County Fair, which is one of the counties where the wild is situated, in 2013, and we presented our project to the community. The idea, uh, so in this figure here, you see these farmers looking at a poster that tells what are we doing, why are we doing it, where are we sampling? What type of samples are we collect collecting? In that way, in a very simple diagram, we tell people we are looking for wildlife livestock diseases and, um, and we want to collaborate with you. We would like to have access to the farm to pick up scats, but also to collect samples from uh, cattle. Also, we have some talks with hunters and that also allow to bring other type of collection of samples and, and you will see this coming. Um, so we know in general that human perceptions, attitudes, and beliefs could modify infectious diseases. So it's, in, it's really important to bring this community aboard. And finally, the main player of this is Neospora caninum. 
So Neospora caninum is a parasite and it's a multi-host pathogen. This parasite causes abortion in li livestock and uh, wild animals, as you see in Per David here. And it causes also economic losses. So in, two, in 2013, there is a research uh, made by an economist that calculated or estimated a, a loss of 843 million annually uh, due to this parasite in a dairy uh, industry. Now, this is the transmission cycle of Neospora caninum, and this transmission cycle is really complex. So I'm just going to, to, to highlight um, three aspects of this. So one is that there are two types of cycles. So there is a salvitic cycle, and there is a domestic cycle. The other is that there are two types of transmission. The horizontal transmission, that will be from the canids to the ruminants, and there is a vertical transmission, so from the, the cows to the calves. And finally, that there are two types of hosts. The definitive host, so those hosts will uh, allow for the parasite to reproduce within them, the egg of this parasite will be shed in the feces. Those feces will contaminate grass and water sources. And then the intermediate host, so it will grow like uh, develop another two phases of this parasite, they will become infected when they ingest contaminated water or, um, or grass. And the canids, which are the definitive host, they become infected through different sources, so through predation, but also, like maybe there are some handling, uh, farm handling tissue or offal that could be live outside. So it's an easy access for dogs and also in general coyotes or wildlife canids. So they can become infected or during hunting season. Because normally what happens in Ohio is that the uh, hunters will leave the offal outside in the field. That's a common practice. But that also allows to a very easy uh, way to, uh, to interface this transmission cycle. So how did I study this uh, multi-host pathogen in this uh, complex system? So I break down the epidemiology, the epidemiological continuum in three layers. So we have the layer of the environment, the layer of the ruminants, and the layer of the definitive host, the canids. So in order for the parasite to move to the ruminants, then the ruminants will have to ingest grass or water. And then the parasite to move to the next layer, then the canid will have to predate or eat uh, contaminated tissue. And uh, canid will shed the parasite and the cycle completes. So to do that, I took, an, uh, it's a, uh, a problem solving approach, and I'm gonna talk to you my three, about my three projects. The first one is estimating Neospora caninum prevalence in wildlife populations using Bayesian inference. The second one was to estimate the exposure of a small coccidia from white canine feces in rural Ohio. And the third one is host species heterogeneity in the epidemiology of Neospora canine. And I'm gonna start with the first one. So this has been already published in Ecology and Evolution in 2016. The objectives are to, um, so to estimate true prevalence of Neospora caninum using Bayesian latent class analysis. So what is true prevalence? True prevalence is the proportion of truly infected animals from a population as opposed to those who test positive for the disease. And the second objective was to estimate the uncertainties about the performance of the commercially uh, test, which, is, which was a competitive ELISA test applying these wildlife populations and again using Bayesian latent class analysis. So why estimating true prevalence is important? So in general, we use that estimate to follow the dynamics of a disease in time and space, to do a risk factor analysis, to evaluate disease control and eradication programs, and to propose a surveillance program. We know that in general, validating this test it's very difficult, and normally what happens is those, those tests are validated in cattle populations, because you can have a hair that it's all healthy, and then you can infect them, and then you test how good your test is performing 
against the individuals that you know that are truly infected versus the ones that are not infected. And you can validate this test. However, for wildlife populations, this might be impossible, simply because of behavior. Sometimes you cannot handle that much. You cannot infect endangered species. So there are other type of tools that we can use to still have a sense of the uncertainty of this test, which are statistics. So I use the Bayesian later class analysis. For this, we have three target populations. We have bison, per David deer, and white-tailed deer. And this is the sample size. Uh, so the, ba the base rule tells us the relationship between two conditional probabilities. So it will tell us the probability of defection, given the test, it's proportional to the probability of the test, given the infection, times the probability of infection. And for that, I'm going to simplify what is this about. So when we test animals, in general, we get two types of results. Is the animal either positive, A, or is either negative? And that's the only thing that we know. So now, what this type of analysis do is that we don't have the animals that are truly infected and tested positive or truly infected but tested negative. When we don't have this data, we call that latent data or missing information. That's why the name of latent patient class analysis. And class is because they are within a class. Um, so this analysis they, uh, do that. So in results for this uh, uh, research was that we have here apparent prevalence and true prevalence. And we see that for the American bison, we have a very similar uh, prevalence between the two, the apparent and true prevalence. And we can say that perhaps in the, at this, with this species, the test is performing good enough. So this test actually has been validated for cattle. So you think, well, it's coming from the same family, bison. Uh, so it's performing very well. But what happens when we use it in pear David deer and white tailed deer? For per David deer, the apparent prevalence has an overestimation of the prevalence. And for the white deer, we actually get an underestimation uh, of the prevalence. So this is really important to figure out if you are going to follow up a surveillance program so you know what to expect in terms of numbers and uncertainty about your test. Um, then this graphic also shows the prevalence of these three different species, but in a di diagram form. And that is, um, so the bison actually has a very uh, small prevalence. And per David deer, it's, uh, it's this one, so it's around a mode of 52%. White-tailed deer is really spread. So we have a lot of uncertainty with what's going on there with, with white-tailed deer. And that, the first question that comes is, OK, why do these species have different prevalence? If they are all in the same ecosystem, what is it making those species having different prevalence? So in summary, for this project, I evaluated the layer of the middle, the ruminant population. The Bayesian latent class analysis methods could be used to estimate through prevalence. The surveillance programs need to take into account that some infected white-tailed deer may not test positive. And uh, so that's with a competitive ELISA test. It's a serology test. And the difference in true prevalence suggests difference in the epidemiology of Neospora caninum of these collocated populations. So my next uh, project is about, well, if these species have different prevalence, maybe it's the environment. Maybe the spatial distribution of the parasite in the environment is going to allow me to understand why these species have this different prevalence. And this project is about that. And it's in press right now in the American Journal of Veterinary Research. So what we wanted to do is to de determine the risk of exposure of Neospora caninum from wild canidae cats to ruminant species in southeastern Ohio. And I just want to tell you a little bit of coyotes. So coyotes were mainly distributed in the central part of North, Amer North America around 1700. Then after there was uh, the, the wolves were removed from the natural environment, the coyotes could really uh, move to other spaces in North America. Uh, so in early 1900s, there is like this clear gray that they go all the way to uh, Alaska now. And right now, actually, coyotes are 
all North America, but also all the way to Central America. So this map actually right now is short. So it goes all the way to Costa Rica. So the expansion is really interesting in terms of a spatial spread of this species. But also, when you go to regionally, and then you look at the population of the coyotes in Ohio, you see this trend of going the number of coyotes in that area. So the x-axis will be the years, and the y-axis is the sightings per thousand hours. And what we see here is that the livestock uh, losses by predation represents in Ohio around 5.6% of all the total deaths in Ohio. Um, and so what does this tell us in general? So these are statistics about predation. It, it is telling us about the probability that transmission cycles, such as Neospora canino, multi-host pathogens, could be also increasing. So it's a way to start understanding what is this risk uh, going to be when we have this population growing in that area. For this study, uh, so this, um, this is the wilds again. So the back layer is the counties at Ohio. The shape, the polygon shape that is here, that's actually the wilds. It's a, it's a really big area. And in the center, it's really small there, but there is the central pastures where the wild animals actually are. So what I did here is that I draw concentric rings to sample the, the, the feces that are in the environment. And that, uh, those rings were given due to the home range of the coyotes in that area. So we took into account that to figure out how do we want to sample these, uh, um, these scats. Now, coyotes really like to use transects, like roads made by cows, by humans, by cars, and they deposit their scats there. So we just walk transects, collect the feces there, clean once the transect, repeat the collection, and we could get some numbers of relative abundance of these animals, and also where is the prevalence of this parasite. We also categorize the, the, the feces by a species, just morphologically, and we did also a, a, a molecular test. And we evaluate that the freshness, because that could impact actually the, uh, how do you find the parasite or not. For that, we use two types of tests, fecal plotation and uh, PCR for host identification and parasite identification. So what are the results? We did a total of 56 trances were surveyed, and that incorporated the wilds and farms around the wilds. This map is, again, um, so the back layer is the counties, and the polygon of the wilds is here, so you don't see it very well. But this, the size of the circles will be the, the sample size of feces being collected at each transect. So as, uh, if they are large, that means that we have more samples in that area. If they are small, less samples. And then the colors being black, the relative abundance for fox, and being in uh, gray, the relative abundance on coyotes. So in general, in this area, we have more coyotes distributed than fox. Um, and this is the map, but now for the proportion of coccidian positive. So we did exactly the same. The size of the cycle will be the sample size at each location. And the colors, if it's black, will be a positive sample. And if it's uh, negative, it, it will be the white color there. So we found a total of 18% sam of the samples were positive to the presence of coccidia. However, when we, did the, when we arrived to the PCR test, we, ha we found 0% prevalence of Neospora caninum. So none of the samples were positive. Due to uh, using some statistics, um, we could calculate the maximum prevalence that we could find in this environment. Uh, but there was none positive in the samples. Uh, so for that, in summary, I evaluated the layer of the environment. And what we found is that the, the results really suggest that the role of the environmental phase of the parasite in the environment is actually likely minor for this species. So at that moment, it was, for me, like, it's not the environment. The species have different prevalence. What's going on? So for that, then I did the next project. So we study host species heterogeneity to understand the epidemiology of Neospora caninum of this species. And this has been published in PLOS One 2017. 
Okay. Um, so the objective is to determine the role uh, of host species heterogeneity in the epidemiology of Neospora canina. And we have three target populations, cattle, per David deer, and white-tailed deer. This is the sample size. The methods that I use, I use a cross-sectional epidemiological study. So I went once and took the samples for each of these species. For the cattle, we use actually the Moscongin livestock auction. So in the areas surrounding the wilds, there is no, the farmers really don't have handling facilities. So you have to use whatever it is in that community. So what I did is went to the auction, talked to the owner, talked to the farmers, and we get the permits uh, to get all this sampling going on. So we went there, uh, yeah, almost all summer to collect all the samples. Uh, we took just three samples per farmer, and we know this they will bring trucks, so we don't want to have a repeated sample from the same farm. So we tried to, uh, we waited given this, the, the different um, locations that we were sampling. For per day deer, again, we, we needed to use the resources that are there. So we use the annual health evaluation that the wild does to all these species. So we went at that time, so they actually uh, handle this spe species, they put it in a shuttle, so you can go and do all the blood sampling, and uh, like eight, we took also age um, data. And for white deer, hunting season. So I put a um, station there, and you know, we talk with hunters, so we were able to get a lot of samples from those, uh, from, from that resource, and that was really, really useful. Uh, finally, well, we, we did a serology test and we take age data, and I apply a catalytic and reverse catalytic models. All right. <laughs> so the catalytic and reverse catalytic model, the first thing is we wanted to know the memory of the immune system by a species. And what I'm telling here, I'm just going to simplify this. And so we have normally seronegative samples or seronegative animals, and these animals will become seropositive at some force of infection. So we have negative and positive samples, we have age structure, and we can see if these animals seroconvert, and we also can found that if those animals could wane immunity. So animals that are seropositive, then later on will be again seronegative. And so we calculated that omega is the duration of natural seropositive, that will be the inverse of omega. And um, finally, we also did the species-specific contribution of the persistence of Neospora caninum in the community by calculating the reproductive number. So the reproductive number is the number of secondary cases arising from a primary case. If you have a reproductive number less than one, that means that there are going to be interrupted chains of transmission, and therefore you may need an outside source of infection to have that hair infected again. And if you have unknown more than one, that means that you have continuous chains of transmission within that species, so you may not need an outside source for this population to maintain the parasite within that hair. So what we found was that cattle, and I use all true prevalence, we found that cattle has waning immunity and is less than one. Per David deer is waning immunity also, but is uh, greater than one, and white tailed deer has a lifelong immunity and it's in the border of being one. So what does it uh, make of sense in, in terms of, in the summary? So the, uh, cattle has waning immunity, so perhaps some vaccine will help to boost uh, this immunity in this species. Has a reproductive number less than one, that means that cannot maintain the parasite within the hair, and so it may need an outside source for reintroduction. So there may be some control for canids, not allowing the dogs be close to that or having some type of management to maintain the coyotes outside of your hair. Also, if you have a closed hair, so you don't bring cattle inside, or if you bring them, you quarantine, you test them, you make sure those are not, because the transmission can be also vertical. Uh, so those will be some control strategies that you can use for this species. 
For pervivirin, again, waning immunity, so perhaps development of vaccines for this species will be useful. The reproductive number is more than one, so it seems that uh, they can maintain the parasite within them, and maybe outside sources might not be needed, like control outside sources may not be uh, something that you would like to invest. Um, and finally, for white tailed deer, it's lifelong immunity. So maybe there is natural boosting going on there. Uh, there may not need, be need for a vaccination. There are in the edge of the, on the, of the border of one. So here the sample size was small. So I think that, so these, all these parameters will be really modified, depends on your sample size, your study design. Uh, so you have to plan for that, and you have to take that there is going to be some uncertainty around these ones. So in general, it will be best to have more sample size for this per, for white tail deer to, to make sure that one is really one or not. And uh, so control of outside sources may not make a difference also. And for that, the overall conclusions is that difference between apparent and true prevalence should be taken into account in these type of studies. The role of the environmental phase of Neospora caninum shared by the wild canids is slightly minor. And prevention and control strategies will depend on the target population. OK, so with that, I'm going to move to the next topic. So now it's expanding my knowledge, what I'm doing right now, my current research. So I work at, with two um, agencies, with the USDA department. I am working, collaborating with ARS, and they are mainly pathologists. We work with food and mouth disease, and they have this wonderful uh, experimental data, ex experimental transmission data working. Right now I am working just with the swine, but there are many different projects. Pe people is uh, using different animals to so study this. And uh, I collaborate also with the Center for Epidemiology and Animal Health with modelers. So in that term, it's like the, all this effort to understand the diseases and even the experimental, now is being translated to parameters uh, to be used in simulation models. So how does microbial work fit? So I'm working with food and mouth disease virus. It's a multi-host pathogen. It's a highly infectious virus, and uh, it causes uh, economic losses due to trade restriction issues. And the first thing was to define the distinct uh, food and mouth disease stages for model parameterization. So the, we know that the disease progression is going to be continuous. But models really take these discrete parameters. So what we do is defining these different disease stages. So we know there are three main ones, the latent, the incubation, and the infectious period. So the latent will be from infection to infectious, so capable of being transmitting disease to others. The incubation is from infection to prior to onset of clinical signs, and we mainly use clinical signs as a passive surveillance to figure out this type of diseases. And finally, the infectious period. How long does this last actually? So we know how much transmission is being uh, done before we actually detect it. And, um, and doing that, so we have the fine, but also get the parameter. So what's the duration of the latent, what's the duration of incubation, and the infectious period. Those parameters are used in different type of models. Uh, and mainly these models that, that we do there are answering question of what if. What if we vaccinate? What if we detect disease early? So these type of models allow us to answer these questions by using different metrics. So we have duration of an outbreak, number of first infected, numbers of animal depopulated. So with that, we can compare different scenarios and, and, and start strategizing what do we want to, to do, what is the most cost-effective control surveillance uh, um, strategy. And those models are also incorporated with other type of models, such as economic models. So people, once we have this data, then they say, oh, OK, so if you depopulate 1,000 animals, how much is going to be we losing? And how much are we spending in controlling it? So then there is a balance there of wh what type of decisions we take. And of course, these type of models generate really large type of data sets. 
and it's really difficult sometimes to communicate that with decision makers and with public in general. Like, why are we sampling? Why are you coming here? And why are you telling me that the populating is the best? So I've been working also in, collaborate, in collaboration to develop applications, an, an interface uh, friendly application. I'm using um, R and using R Shiny and developing this application to, to have an, an easy access to already analysis being done. So in this case, this is just a dummy uh, model. But in this case, we compare four types of scenarios. So we have the early, late, vaccination early, vaccination late. And then we can see the epidemic course. So we know it's no more than 80 days. And we can see the outbreak duration. So we know that if you detect early, actually, you will have a less, um, your average will be less. And you can click. This is really um, interactive. So you click in these ones, and you can see Normally, we run 20, 21 scenarios. And so people, it's really hard to compare all these scenarios if you don't have this type of tools. And there are other, also other tabs. So right now, this is just uh, the ADSAM. So ADSAM is the animal disease spread model. That's freely available to use. And so people, it's mainly right now just for livestock populations. And it's mainly for highly infectious diseases. So there is no vector-borne disease or wildlife. So they are trying to really bring more about the wildlife and how do we incorporate wildlife in these type of models. OK, and finally, I'm going to talk about the mission, vision, and plan for the new disease uh, ecology program at Ubalde. And um, my mission will be to for the new disease ecology program to enhance sustainable livelihoods by actively understanding complex adaptive systems and applying problem solving approaches. And I am very interested, uh, my, my research motivation of what I do is in general around this question. So how complex systems adapt to changing circumstances? A changing circumstance could be a weather pattern, been uh, modified, but also interventions. We do a lot of interventions. Uh, we want to handle uh, wildlife. We want to handle livestock. We put vaccines. So what happens with these multi-host pathogen systems when you do an intervention in one species but not in other, in other one? How do, are we going to measure that? And what type of adaptation do we want? Can models help us to strategize and maybe um, try to to see the different scenarios and, and start making decisions, or at least to say, OK, let's go to the field and now apply this one, and let's see how it behaves, and I start getting data for that. How am I going to do that? So my vision is that through collaboration work. So these are very, very big projects that, in general, you need different approaches. You need to use methodologies from different disciplines. Uh, and you also need ideas from different disciplines. So we grow with different uh, philosophies. So it's good to understand uh, what, for example, anthropology. How does anthropology can intervene, like studies of human dimension? Or economics, how do we bring uh, economics to uh, start doing these decisions? So I have uh, here several departments where I've been working, uh, not with Texas, of course, but um, like through my career, I've been working with these different disciplines. So anthropology. Uh, entomology, the Department of Wildlife Diseases, um, Science, Mathematics, Statistics, Geography. So that's one of my plans. So really bring this collaboration and, and interchange ideas and apply uh, to understand these multi-host complex systems. And how I will expect to do that? And what's the really, uh, in general, the big vision? <coughs> so the vision is, of course, is going to be a long term. I don't see this happening. like. No, I, I see this as a, my life. And um, I definitely would like to have more like a nationally inter, an internationally recognized program that will provide solutions. We provide a consulting expertise, and we do some innovation. And how I'm going to arrive to that step is just through short terms and making uh, short projects that will add, add to the whole. And um, so of course, the first years, I expect to do a lot of networking with all of you, try to figure out what do you do, what are the gaps, how can we collaborate. Um, 
the, the second term, I want to bring the international collaboration. So I have the ability to speak English and Spanish. And being in this area of the country, in the border, I will really like to start partnering with Mexico. So what type of strategies Mexico is doing? And we share the disease, so there is no border in, in the diseases. So I think uh, bringing that uh, communication and trying to do a strategies could help in general for, for these uh, complex systems. And uh, well, later on in the midterm, hopefully we have some international collaborations going on, trainings going on in, in, the, in Uvalde, so bringing also with all the modeling, bringing uh, um, state people to be trained to this type of models for emergency preparedness, international people also coming and to understand these ones. Um, and also, I really see this ecosystem at Uvalde to be a, something that attracts and to bring people to, to say, OK, how is these people understanding complex adaptive systems? So I think that's a unique environment there to bring uh, people in that area. And while there will be some of the funding sources that, that I am aware that we could be using and, and collaborating. And so to. Just as a conclusion, this performance system exemplify what I see in general in uh, the, the program. So it will be through a mission and vision that is characterized by multidisciplinary and international collaborations. And that will shape the leadership of our scientific community. And that will help us to align to the Texas A&M culture. And with that, I really want to acknowledge all the people that I've been working. As I told you, I think this is uh, definitely um, a project and a lot of projects and a lot of my career being developed through wonderful people that I've been meeting, um, mainly from graduate school, postdoctoral research. And this is really important for me to really thank the farmers. So without them, I wouldn't be able to walk in their farms to collect any sample. Uh, to the hunters that they brought, like I wouldn't be able to carry the white deer, and they do, and they put it in your station. And you know, there is a really nice collaboration in that part. Um, of course, wildlife, USDA. And with that, uh, I will take questions. And thank you very much for being here. Any questions for Dr. Moreno? Yes. Um, I may have missed this. Do you have an estimation for how long the parasite uh, remains within the canid populations or even the individuals? Yeah, I think when I think they get um, when that when once they are infected, they are infected their whole life. Okay. But the parasite can be latent, okay. so they can they, it can be paused uh, in some way, yeah. and then uh, be shed again for different circumstances. Um, do you have? measurement for a potential mutation rate for the parasite? A potential mutation? Mutation rate for the parasite, right? No. Not really. I didn't work in that area of that. But yeah. I think definitely something very interesting to take into account. And also, I, I want to mention, so it's very important to see what type of test we are using. So in this case, I use a, a fecal flotation that just tells you just a general view, you have coccidia, and this is like a Neospora caninum, you really have to do tests that are confirmatory, like the PCR. So when we saw the PCR and we have 0% prevalence, now you start like, oh. So that's very important. And I started to understand other molecular um, aspects of that. So you related to that because I got lost in that part. So the 18% refer to the flotation test, and then the 0% is the PCR? Yes, Okay. correct. I was thinking like, how? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, the 80% was uh, due to flotation test. Yes. Um, have you tried, um, um, do you have enough data to uh, incorporate the layers into, for instance, a GIS projection? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so all that actually, so I use RGIS. Oh. And I use R also within that. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are different tools. So I, this, this was, I uh, really had to make all the project really short. Yeah. But there is a lot more specific things in, in, in the papers. But what I did actually, so we took another type of sample. So we took density of cattle and also the environment. So we have crop, livestock farms, or uh, forest. So I, I took those measurements from the environment. 
and we run a logistic a regression logistic, uh, spatial reg regression logistic analysis to see if any of these other factors are actually the ones that are modifying through coccidia positive because Neospora canin was negative, and none of those factors. But I also run one that um, I use weather uh, data, so I use humidity, temperature, and that was really interesting. Actually, temperature that was the only one that came significant in this model, and the temperature uh, so ranged. I think I don't remember exactly. Maybe I have it in centigrade, so 20, 24 to to 28, something like that, the centigrade. It's in the paper, I think. Uh, at, that temp at that range, actually, what we found is that the probability that getting a positive sample is higher than the negatives. And this is uh, also another aspect. Is, is it because we get that prevalence? We we got those tests positive because, um, OK, how do I say no? We get that prevalence because of the, really, that was the true prevalence in the environment, or because the weather that was there maybe desiccated some of these parasites, yeah. and we just didn't find them. Just because of, as I show you, we measure the freshness of the, fest of the feces. And that also could be a factor. So it may not necessarily that parasite is there is not there. Maybe yeah, there are other factors, such as how the environment at the time that you collect the sample, are you getting the, sam the, the, the parasite or not? So yeah. there are, yeah. Okay, cool. So the PCRs then were on fecal material? Yes. And is it possible that the primers that you used were too specific that you missed Neospora, if there's any genetic variation within caninum across its distribution? Yeah, I. So it was really a specific, that's for sure. So we make sure we wanted to get that because we have other parasites that we have to differentiate. So Toxoplasma gondii, Sarcocystis. So it was really a specific, but I think we still. Uh, I'm not really a molecular person, but I think um, you would still get the Neospora, in that sense. So it, even if it's maybe a modification, you would still know it's Neospora canino. Yes. Yeah. So you were sampling scat from coyote and uh, fox. Mm -hmm. I don't, can you distinguish coyote from dog? <laughs> from dog? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, well, no, it all depends, I guess, in general. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you how. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Also smell it. Yeah. It, it is different. <laughs> yeah, so there, there's no chance you could. No, and we did a subset of samples doing PCR just to make sure that we had the host species. And also, within those, uh, actually, the feces, we recorded a cer certainty level. So that means that when I pick up a feces, I was, I'm 100% sure it's Cayo, or I'm 50% is Cayo. So I also run that uncertainty about me, and I have a lot of students helping me. So I told them, please record how, how sure you are this is a scat of Cayo versus a fox. But in general, there are guides, uh, morphological guides, that help you to characterize these feces. And it depends on the environment and the season, the feces will change. So if the Cayos are eating a lot of fruit, ooh, that's really hard. But if they are not eating a lot of fruit, they really come with a lot of hair. They end with a comat shape that is really, really characteristic. You will see the bones there and the diameter is around two centimeters, while the fox is very similar, but smaller. Um, and, and dogs, most of the dogs that I, we did sample dogs. Dogs were negative, all clean, from farmers. So we went there and sampled dogs. And they, they do eat a lot of uh, food for dogs. So you see the consistency of the feces is totally different. So you know, you know, um, but we did uh, PCR. Also, yeah. So, uh, what's the rest of the story on the Pierre Davis year? Did they have subsequent <laughs> abortion the following year, or was this just a one-time event? Yeah, that's a good question. Anyway, I can answer from the point of view of diagnostics. Mm -hmm. I told you I did a serology test. Serology test will allow you to see exposure, never infection. 
We never had the chance to have actually samples. So you could collect tissue samples and do a PCR or a immunohistochemistry to figure out oh, the parasite is actually here. For Perdé, we did, we did not do that. We didn't have the chance. We tried with the bison. Coyotes won all the time the placenta. So it's really difficult to handle wildlife, as you all know. So those type are like limitations of the project. So we did not, but Perdé, we did just recover. And in some way, uh, there is a lot to be understanding. And this is a model. So we still need to figure out what is really happening. But it seems that as the animals get older, they may have some immunity going on. So you may still get infected animals, but not abortions. You can still get uh, calves being infected, but not abortions. So we really don't know what happened. There, I haven't, when I finished this, I didn't hear again that there is another abortion. And, and I don't know right now the status of that. But yeah. For white and deer, we collected samples. So we collected like, placenta. This parasite really likes the brain. So we collect brain, the fetus, and I did PCR, negative. So sero serology was positive. But when you go to really detect the parasite, that's another world. Like you really have to figure out the diagnostics and different uh, steps to get this parasite. So yeah. You have a question? No, I have to use oh. the same animal. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any, any other questions? All right, well, th uh, thank you. Uh, uh, while we have everyone here, uh, I'd like to thank the committee uh, in the room, Dr. Perry Barboza and, and Dr. Walt Cook, uh, the, for their effort. And also uh, would like to recognize uh, Dr. Dave Lunt, the Associate Director for AgriLife.